What's up, guys? This is David, a.k.a. Reverse Long. Today, I have the pleasure of having Tom Basso on the podcast. Tom Basso is one of the market wizards. And uh, yeah, I've had Jack Schwager on for three episodes now. So it's great to be get, connect with the market wizards. We had uh, Victor Sperandio on before, Jack Schwager on three times. And now we have Tom Tom Basso on the podcast. So Tom, Tom Basso uh, has a website. Uh, what is it again? Enjoytheride.world. Enjoy the ride that world. So he's going to tell us all about that and about his whole journey into trading and everything. And his, uh, I think he has, like, he said he had like a hundred positions on or something, <laughs> yeah, something like that before the podcast started. So, um, yeah. So Tom, how you doing? I'm doing great. I had a good day today. It was, uh, got everything done that I wanted done and, uh, positive returns on the port, uh, all the portfolios. And, uh, so yeah, everything's good. Awesome. Awesome. So yeah, so Tom, you want to give us a background? Let's see uh, uh, your journey into the markets and to, you know, your overall history where you are now. And I know you're heavy into trend following and yeah, just uh, take us through. Yeah. The, the, when I started out, I, you know, I was an engineer, chemical engineer by degree. And I just figured back in the seventies, they were doing a lot of these. Uh, we had kind of booms where they hired a lot of engineers and then recessions where engineers got laid off. And so I thought I better put away some money and, you know, get prepare for a rainy day, basically. So I started saving some of my engineering salary. I was a single guy. It was easy to save lots of money. And the portfolio got a little bigger and I realized that, hey, I got to do something with this. So I started looking at stocks and I looked at fundamentals and I looked at all this stuff. And eventually being the engineer that I was, I sort of you know, logged in what I thought was working well, what it wasn't working well. And little by little, uh, gravitated towards more number crunching. And the number crunching sort of led me to uh, to realize that mathematically, if you can pick up a very big move uh, up or down in, in anything, uh, that is worth so much that it pays for a lot of small losses. So I became a trend follower. I didn't even know the term existed when I started. It just seemed like the logical way to go. And uh, one thing led to another and I got into futures. So now I trade uh, close to 30 futures markets and 30 different sector ETFs and some index options and crypto futures and all sorts of other things. I've got a lot of positions on across now uh, 10 strategies I'm running. And uh, so each strategy has different indicators, different time periods. I, uh, I trade some on 50 a day and 21 day and nine day and three day. And uh, occasionally like this morning, I was sitting at the computer, I did two day trades even. So I span a big time horizon. I span lots of different indicators and lots of different markets. And that's where the, the all-weather trader book that I wrote last April came from is just my life's journey of leaving engineering, uh, you know, starting a, a money management firm, uh, running a money management firm for 28 years, having a great success there. When Jack Schwager picked me up for uh, the Market Wizards thing and Mr. Serenity. Uh, and then... You know, I retired back in 2003. I've had basically 20 years of retirement. I love it. And I, I don't have any government restrictions on me anymore with my trading. I don't have client restrictions on me for my trading. And I can do what I need to do. It's fun. Awesome. And um, so you said you came from an engineering background. What, what kind of engineering was it again? Chemical. Chemical engineering. So it is that like really mathematical base? And like you came from that like analytical side? Yeah. Uh... I use this analogy. Uh, the first chemical engineering course you take is process engineering, it's called. And it's sort of quite a, a simple example. You can imagine a pipe coming into a tank and it's delivering water into the tank at a rate of some kind of GPM, gallons per minute. Then there's a drain out the other side of the the tank and it's got flows, you know, draining the tank at the same time. So stuff's coming in, stuff's going out. Uh, and you got to be able to figure out how long does it take to fill the tank or to empty the tank or whatever. 
And all that is chemical engineering. It, it was sort of the mentality of bring something in, process it, send it out. Isn't that what we do as traders? It's so natural. We take in information. We have uh, chart patterns. We have data. Oh, my God. The data involved in all the investment markets is unbelievable how much of data there is. And then what we do as traders is we process it. We use whatever algorithms, whatever strategy to say, I'm going to buy or sell or whatever I'm going to do. And then you have to outflow the information in the form of orders and position sizing and all that good stuff. So it's sort of like, like chemical engineering, uh, information in, process it, information out. So interesting. So interesting. So so would you say that's more along the side of like a quantitative approach towards trend following? Is that Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. I don't look at <clears throat> any judgmental things anymore. I mean, I have everything uh, with complete logic and math. I, I don't sit here and make any decisions at all. It's all my decisions. You know, this most recent 10th strategy is a good example. I've been working on it for about 10, uh, well, about six, seven months now. That's where my decisions come in. That's where my discretion comes in, where I'm trying to come up with something that solves a particular piece of the puzzle that I haven't solved yet. So I work really hard on what does it need to have in it? What markets does it need to trade? What kind of time period do I want? Uh, what am I going to do for my position sizing to keep that in sync with everything else? And that's where I, you, you have the creative mind and the artist side of the brain, the right side of the brain to create something that is going to solve the issues that you're trying to solve with that strategy. Once I solve it or I figure that I've got it all figured out, then it's just execute, execute flawlessly day after day, just run it. And um, did you notice that strength of yours, especially, I mean, you came from a chemical engineering, so it must have just uh, made sense for you to like go into the quantitative side. Because I know, I know like when people start out, so, like, for example, for myself, I was confused whether I should go more discretionary or more systematic, which is numbers based or, you know, uh, quantitative approach. So how did you decide, OK, this is my strength and, and realize that? Because it sounds like you realized it pretty soon. And you didn't yeah. waste waste any time trying to figure it out, like as far as well, discretionary. Yeah, it was probably in the first few years of because I realized that uh, mentally, when you're, I think mental side of trading is probably the most important thing over even top of crunching numbers. But if because if you don't have your head screwed on straight, the markets can really rip you to shreds. Uh, I think what I found is with discretion, you are much more liable to have erratic performance and erratic decision-making because it depends a lot on almost your mental state and how you've approached each one of the decisions you have to make. And how do you, how do you really become that good that you are almost a robot and you can reproduce this thing over and over again? To me, it's it's a lot easier to come up with measurements of the data that's coming in and figure out, all right, well, this amount of movement every day is noise. The market has lots of noise. But just like a chemical engineering um, situation where, let's say, you're trying to heat a process with a, a steam heat exchanger. If you're measuring the temperature of the heat exchanger and the temperature gets too cold, what, what do you have to do? You have a control loop that says, hey, put more steam into the heat exchanger and heat this thing up. So at night, when the temperatures get cool, you you know automatically things are happening to keep the process at a certain temperature. And it could happen the other way. You could have it getting too hot. So then you have to bring in cooling. Instrumentation does that too. So to me, it's it's not unlike the uh, the markets where you have markets going sideways, let's say, and nothing's happening. But you know, inside the band it's noise. But at some point, it's clear that the trend is starting. And it's outside the noise band, time to buy. On the other side, if it goes through the bottom side, it's clear that the market's not holding the noise band, it's time to sell, either to get out of a long or to go short. 
sell futures, whatever you're doing, you know? And uh, I think that's, I saw that as being such a, it, it's so easy for me to understand being a chemical engineer that I just kept applying that kind of logic over and over again, short-term indicators. So short-term time frames and noise, longer term time frames and noise and just measuring where where the noise is exceeded and going with it and uh, don't think a whole lot about it just execute that's so interesting so you were able to take the concepts from engineering and move it towards trading and into multiple markets or a lot of different markets and what as you're as you were saying that the example that came in my head so i i have um an architecture background before trading I, i'm an architect and I always, uh, it made it easier for me to relate trading to architecture as like a composer. I always talk about it, like a composer of a symphony and like that. I always have these analogies that I take back to architecture and related to trading. So I think it's cool how like you can take your strengths from something else and apply them, find your niche in trading like that. I think it's really cool. Um, and like now after, so after, you know, being a market wizard and trend following, do all this trading all types of different markets it still ties back to like your chemical engineering background your approach i think it's 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 awesome you know so once you're an engineer you you're not, you, you're always yeah. an engineer, you know absolutely 100 percent. i understand you retire you're still an engineer yeah um yeah my dad was an engineer and like yeah everything uh when i was always he related it back always he was a mechanical engineer so yeah. he would always relate to Talk of you know it's it's really cool. Um, so like with multiple markets. So when did you start to like expand your strategies to multiple markets? Well, it started out because I was a long only stock manager in the early stages. I looked at our clientele and I looked at our strategy, and we had the good fortune of having some good bull markets back when we started up a lot of this stuff, and we had several acquisition candidates that we were able to discover. So our portfolios did really well and our reputation got really good fast. And, uh, and, and it could have been a little bit of luck, whatever, but you know, things were happening. We were raising a lot of capital. And I looked at that and I thought, you know, business wise, if we get in a bear market like 73, 74, where S and P 500 was down 50%, we're, our business is going to get shredded because we are going to be, we're in small cap stocks. If we take two years going down 50%, there isn't going to be anything left of this place. You're going to have to lay everybody off. You know, whatever money's left at that point, you'd have to just shut it down and give it back to the clients. And I thought that's kind of a dumb long-term strategy for a company. So I started thinking about what can I do to diversify the business? And uh, the, the most obvious thing was to time the stock market a little bit or to put some risk protection behind some of the positions so that if things went the other way, at least you'd go to cash. But we were managing a lot of pension business and pensions uh, kind of have this uh, focus or objective of I'm hiring you to buy my long stocks. So you need to keep doing that. Sadly, if you keep doing that, they'll fire you because you're going to hit a bear market and you'll lose some money. And then they'll say, well, you're losing money, so you're fired. Even though we're doing exactly what they want us to do for them. And if we told them we were going to time out into cash, they would say, why are we paying you all these fees to put us in a money market fund? We could do that on our own. So this is what you fight with client psychology. And uh, one of the many reasons why I have a smile on my face in retirement, <laughs> I don't have any clients. <laughs> and uh, so that's, that's kind of what you faced. And uh, as I diversified, I immediately saw, well, wait, how about futures? You can go long and short with equal ease. And if I'm trading something like corn, it doesn't care what the stock market's doing. How about things like the Euro or back in those days, the German mark? So, you know, that wow. doesn't care what the stock market's doing. So I started realizing that if you could put together a lot of independent return streams, that you're going to smooth out your equity curve. And I'm big on peace of mind and being Mr. Serenity. Uh, with Jack called me uh, in the book, 
you know, I, I see no reason to stress yourself out over all this stuff. So to me, if I can trade like 65 markets or positions that I'm in now, probably maybe 70, you know, I've got so many return streams on that. I've got green in some cases, I've got red in others, and I'm just looking to add it all up and hope that the total is green for the day. And I'm running about 48 to 49% of my days are profitable. So I'm running about half and half. I have up days and down days. Uh, last two days have been big up days. The days before that were two uh, minor down days. So I, what I try to do is when you add it all up, hopefully it's profitable. And number two, I'd like to get as many of those positive days as possible so that it's just consistent. And that's why I continue to develop new strategies and keep working at it. Now, the, the strategy that you're developing or the strategies of how you always, how you went about it before as to now, was it always similar, except now you just have more experience and it's compounded and you have more strategies that's added up over time? Yeah, or... what I try to do is I look at <laughs> look at what I'm doing and I look back at some historical databases and, and you know, take my existing strategies and look at them and say, well... You know, I had this drawdown back here in 2000 and, you know, like the COVID uh, drawdown was a little bit of a drawdown, but then turned right into a huge profit. So if I look at that on the track record and then I go analyze it and I try to pick apart or do a postmortem on how did that drawdown really happen? What markets affected it? What types of indicators were the biggest contributing factor were they longer term indicators were they shorter term indicators was there any particular markets that contributed too much to it and when you analyze that and you try to figure out okay if i were then to invent a strategy that would make a ton of money during that type of condition those types of markets what would it look like and i start just I pull out a Word document and I start writing. I start thinking about what would I want to try to get? What would I need in data? What do I need in, in some kind of a math that would work? Do I want it long-term? Do I want it short-term? How am I going to position size? All of those questions. And I'll just freeform my thoughts, kind of brainstorming with myself. And then I'll start doing some studies and uh, put some indicators on some screens and do some manual work and try to understand how these things work and then move it to the form of automation where I'm pulling in the data, running the uh, programs and hopefully generating orders and shipping them. And it's sort of that kind of a development process over months sometimes. Some indicators and, and strategies would be a little easier to put together. Some are more complicated and require more, but that's kind of, been the way I keep adding new strategies and I'll be working on number 11 next. Awesome. It sounds like, like it's an enjoyable process for you being Mr. Serenity. Right. But like, uh, was it always like uh, enjoyable? It sounds like you're having fun uh, with this. When I, when I was a lot younger than you, even I, uh, I was very overly caffeinated <laughs> and, uh, I, I was pretty stressed out a lot of the time. So definitely not Mr. Serenity. <laughs> I think uh, I think I learned to, uh, well, first to go to decaf because I guess my body doesn't tolerate huge amounts of caffeine very well. Uh, I can feel my heart kind of jumping and uh, I'm going to get more nervous about everything. So I, I try to keep things as even keel as I can. And I think that uh, I think developing a new strategy is where I can use my creative side, because when I trade, if you figure out all the things that I talk about and I do uh, in Twitter posts and everything, I tell you what, what I do is extremely boring. It's not, you're not going to get any adrenaline fix out of what I'm doing. But I, I was up 35% last year. I mean, that's a decent return for a guy in retirement has got plenty of money to live my lifestyle. Uh, you know, I, if I make another million dollars, it's not going to change anything in my life whatsoever. So to me, it's just, uh, it's like a brain tease puzzle that I get to work on all the time. And, uh, that's, that's a fascinating thing. It's like trying to shoot the perfect round of golf. 
you can't ever do it, but you can always try to get a little better, a little better. And that's kind of where I'm at. Awesome. And uh, what, what about last year uh, was like pivotal to have it such a good year compared to like um, other years in the past. And also like, what was like your favorite time for like uh, time period of trade? Like what the bear markets or the bull markets or the crypto or the COVID was kind of crazy. The uh, whole market. COVID was kind of uh, very good to me last year. Uh, so I trade Ether and Bitcoin, and I think those are both good. I also, last year, had some really strange moves in what I would call the softs, which would be things like orange juice, coffee, cocoa. Some of these guys just went nuts and really long runs. Uh, you pick up the trend, you jump on, you just enjoy the ride for quite the, you know, months in some cases. And uh, that was very profitable. And then towards the tail end of the year, the stock market really kicked in the gear. And that seemed to be very profitable as well. So there was a combination of a lot of different markets that really fed the profits. And uh, the whole trend following concept. Okay, so is this like you're, are you looking at the overall, like let's say in futures, coffee, orange juice, whatever, are, are you understanding anything fundamentally or news driven or future, you know, kind of, event driven or are you just going totally data numbers back when the ukraine war was breaking out and i forget i think it was last year right i think we're into now i think we're past the year mark on that uh little did i know i, I was getting a long uh position uh in wheat and all of a sudden it kept going up and i had gone up and i'm thinking what is going on with wheat i'm making all this money but i don't so I actually, probably a month or so after I had gotten into this position and making all this money, I read some article about how Russia is threatening uh, to uh, to bomb some of the ships uh, that are carrying wheat out of Ukraine, which is one of the largest wheat producers in the world. I didn't know that. <laughs> I, just, I just went along with wheat and it worked out. Worked out. I know in in small caps, um, there was some agriculture stocks that were really like trading cents on the dollar, and they spiked tremendously. They went up a few hundred percent points. I think it might have been the same uh, event, <laughs> and yeah. I I didn't know why until later, of course. But yeah, um, I usually can figure it out after the fact. But yeah, at the time I do the first trade, I it's just it's just going up, so I'm buying it. I don't really know why. And how how do you manage the trade? Is it just is it like algorithms that have like stop losses in place and just like buys yeah. it back and sells it and stuff? Or yeah, I have complete uh, <clears throat> algorithms both on price and on position sizing, uh, position sizing, so that I'm managing the position during the entire time frame I'm in uh, the trade, and I'm also managing uh, moving my stops or moving targets, or whatever I'm doing at the, that particular strategy. That all gets done every day, once a day, updated for the next 24 hours, GTC, good till cancel. And uh, yeah, that's that's definitely uh, an important thing, especially position sizing. I think sizing your position right as a trader is more important than worrying about prices uh, or indicators or those types of things. Because if you size it too much, you're bringing that risk of ruin into play and if you size it too little you're not going to make enough money to make it worth your while so you've got to hit that sweet spot and for each trader that's different but i wrote an entire book on that topic called successful traders size their position why and how and thousands and thousands of traders have bought the, the copies of that book for ten dollars and uh, it's only like 80 pages, but I included all the math that I used back in my Trendstat days and I still use today on how to control those position sizes, not only the initial position size, but the ongoing position and how to measure that and, and control it. And it's been, I've used it all the way back to, I've probably used it for the last 40 years or something. And it's been highly successful in keeping my performance smoother. 
Oh, position sense. Uh, great. I'll have that book in the show notes. Um, thank you for bringing that up. That's uh, I know it's going to help a lot of traders out. And it's always good to review that. I know um, position sizing is crucial. So, mm -hmm. um, so do you apply the same kind of concepts for position sizing for all the markets? I mean, more or less? I do in the case of any one strategy, I'll apply a consistent position sizing across that strategy. That allows all of the markets to contribute to that portfolio somewhat equally. The, but a different strategy with different objectives and different things going on, that might have a completely different position sizing strategy, but it's designed to serve a certain purpose with that strategy. So I, what I do is I design position sizing for each of the strategies and then run the strategy forever. Gotcha. And uh, when you were, when you started to hit like a, your successful streak early on, like, um, how did you manage to like expand from that? Was it like, you know, to size up even bigger, to trade more money or accept more risk? And, you know, you know, how did you break well, I, through? I think a lot of people, well, back in the day, 70s, uh, a lot of traders would look at a sort of a stepwise change thing where I'm going to trade $100,000 this way with a certain size of my stock positions. Uh, and then... When I get to 200,000, then I'm going to double my positions. And when I get to 300,000, I'm going to take another 50% larger and so on. Uh, what I do, and I think makes a lot more sense, is just to do it continuously. So I use my mark to market equity every day in all my position sizing. So as my equity grows, so the last couple of days, I've had two really good days. So my equity is bigger. So as I put on positions this afternoon, there may be a couple positions that'll come out a little bit larger orders than they did yesterday or two days ago, because that extra dollars is incorporated into the, uh, the position calculator and it happens automatically. So as I continue to increase equity, I get bigger positions. Okay. Awesome. And, um, are there any special programs you're using or to, for the algorithms and things, or is it just like through the broker? Uh, I, I've i used uh, over time various things. I, I'm at interactive brokers with a lot of my trading. So I use their trader workstation on some stuff. I also, uh, about four years ago, put out, put out the word that I wanted to work with some programmers to create a trading platform. So we have a, a, a trading platform, a guy in, actually, when I get off this call, I'm gonna be talking to him, um, a product called SimTrader, which simulates history and also will end up doing the trading for you each day and ship orders in, uh, at first, at least just to uh, interactive brokers. But that platform, I've now got, uh, how many? Uh, I think I've got seven strategies of the 10 automated on there. So that's takes a big load off me. I mean, all the way from the data comes in, the decisions get made, they ship the orders. All I do is go down and hit transmit, 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 transmit. And I kind of look at the orders, make sure I, that the computer is not screwing up or there isn't some weird piece of data that somehow we didn't catch. Uh, and then the orders go in. So it's pretty painless and fairly boring. Uh, and uh, then I'm done for 24 hours. And the next day I do it again. Awesome. And um, so computers. So before the computers, because you traded, you said in the, the late 70s and the 80s and the 90s. So how did the computer factor in? Especially I know like um, like yeah. in the 70s, it was like there was like a massive computer. I think Ed Sakota used to like, I uh, went into the MIT computer room yeah. or something. It was like the size of like, a, I don't know, it's like a tractor trailer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Hey, when I was uh, taking computer programming in college as an engineer, it was IBM punch cards and mainframes. They didn't even have a, you know, a console. Uh, we finally, by senior year, uh, got one console uh, based, I think it was a digital equipment piece of equipment that traded, uh, you could program basic language on it. And it was real simplistic and very, very, uh, 
easily overwhelmed by your program if you didn't watch what you were doing. And you had to sign up for time on the machine. Uh, you know, there'd be a waiting line uh, to get the thing. It, it's just very strange world. Uh, 1980, you got the PC and I bought my first IBM PC and then I bought the AT, which was the next big uh, launch, uh, about four times faster uh, or so. And uh, bought that in probably 1981 or two, I think. And I just kept proceeding. Uh, when I closed down Trendstat, I was running 40 computers simultaneously. Wow. Wow. So, tr so trading got easier for with the, when the technology got easier for, for the way you trade? For the way I trade, yes. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, um, 40 computers simultaneously. That's that's crazy. So um, how about during the dot-com boom? Um, how was that like? Dot-com was uh, a balloon that, a bubble that burst, uh, you know, along the way. Uh, we made a ton of money going into it. And by then, with the the, uh, the 2000s, I had put in place in the firm lots of different strategies to deal with various aspects. And in the case of all of our mutual fund timing during that year, before we had to shut that down in 2020, uh, 2003, when I retired, 2000, we were able to just go to full cash. So we ducked around a lot of that bear market. And most of our clients in that type of strategy were more retail clients. So they were very thankful that they didn't get shredded. We didn't have so many institutional clients at that point anymore. And then I was running uh, FX and futures markets. So those were unaffected by the dot uh, com bust. So I just cruised right through it. No problem. Wow. And uh, your trend following, but let's say if you were in it hypothetically, would your trend following systematic approach, uh, quantitative approach, would have like it would have it wouldn't have like suffered a, you know, a boom and bust. No, you know, it would have been a, in fact, I probably would have been hedged if I had any long positions left in today's world, and I, in today's strategies and things that I do now, I probably would have went short some index futures. Mm. probably cleaned up on NQ uh, NASDAQ uh, futures to the short side would have, you made a killing on that. So I would have expected to probably actually make money during that period. Wow. It's so interesting to think about because I've interviewed um, quite a few people from that time period and, you know, hypothetically, cause I, I, I wasn't, a, I don't even, I, I had no idea what the stock market even was during that time. I was a kid. Um, yeah, exactly. You're not old <laughs> but, enough. <laughs> but uh but um it's it, it you know just to think about like all these stories like it's insane like um pets.com or something goes like <laughs> it's like stocks uh during covid or something you know it's like but back then it was it, but like with less volume because not everybody had access as much as now and you look at what's happening lately these uh you know the, the magnificent seven where they keep making new highs, NASDAQ keeps making new highs and all that. And you wonder, where does this end? I mean, I think with the speed of computers, one of the things that's changed over my lifetime is if you go well, well before you were born, uh, back to the early days of my trading, and you, you have to think about this, but think about having a rotary phone, okay? It takes forever to dial. Think about calling your broker in, say, St. Louis or wherever, telling him you want to buy. Here's the order. You got to speak it out to him. He repeats it back. You say yes. He puts it in on a teletype desk. The teletype sends that to New York. It goes out on the floor with a human being. It gets to a specialist area. They execute that trade. The confirmation comes back. The teletype operator sends a communication to your broker's office and some person, a secretary or whatever, a teletype operator will run that over to the guy's desk. And then you get a call saying you got to confirm. That's how long it took to do a trade. Back in 74, when I came out of college, a break open the champagne, high volume New York Stock Exchange day was 10 million shares traded. 
And now you got SPYs doing a couple hundred million shares all by themselves, just by one ticker. And and the total exchange trades, you know, over a billion easily. So computers have allowed everything to happen quicker. What I worry about is when you see markets doing what they're doing right now, where it just makes new highs all the time. You know, you got a lot of people that are your age that haven't lived through so many uh, devastating bear markets, but they've been out there in history and they'll happen again. And I tell you what, with the speed of computers, it could happen quick. It wouldn't take maybe a couple of years. Uh, you, could, you could knock off 30, 40, 50 percent, you know, before you blinked. So uh, everybody needs to realize that there's good and bad out there in terms of the risk and manage it well and be prepared to move quickly. Yeah, that's that's an excellent reminder. It's like it's hard to to even fathom that. It's like okay, 10 million shares traded back then it was a champagne popping day in the, in, the, in the in the stock market. Yeah. Now it's like I trade 10 million, I can recycle the shares on my broker just like like a over and over again and I don't think I've hit 10 million yet, but I've hit a couple million myself. Sure. Um, you know, um, yeah, that's absolutely. just insane. So I was thinking, I think someone brought it up. I'm, I, I listened to a lot of podcasts. It might have been you. I might have listened. I listened to a few of your episodes on other podcasts. It might have been yeah. you. Um, but uh, saying that the market cycles can go go faster now, like a bear market can because of technology. People, you know, like, for example, COVID March 2020 was yep. a huge bear market. Uh, market halted down a few times and then it popped V-shaped recovery back yep. to new highs and, and remember still everybody was looking for the w bottom got to test the bottom i'm not going to go in until the market tests the bottom and everybody missed the whole rally that's crazy man so so how did you approach that because you're trading futures and everything that My was indicators uh... uh i have i have some indicators that are more moving average driven uh like keltners and uh things like bollinger bands and when you have that type of uh, a V bottom, what happens is the, the prices are caving in, but that moving average, because you're getting farther and farther away from where the average is, the average is screaming down to catch up. So I didn't catch the bottom there, uh, but I was short a whole bunch of stuff during the COVID crash. And then the V bottom happened and I gave back a little bit of the profits I'd made, but then all the indicators started going over to the upside. So then everything shifted over. Now I'm long everything and making a killing there. My, I think I was up 103% that year in 2020. And I'm just a boring guy trading a boring way. I'm not over leveraged. I'm taking very low uh, percent of equity uh, risk uh, position sizes. Uh, I'm doing the same thing today I was doing back then. You know, and uh, it's just that the markets moved so much that there was just so much potential to make money that the indicators picked it up. And uh, so I didn't credit myself for being smart. I probably credited myself in 2020 more for being uh, disciplined and aware of all the, the emotions that you face when you, you know, you get a world pandemic going on you get the CNNs of the world, you know, predicting everybody's going to die or whatever. Uh, it seems like staying true to what I was doing and just following my strategy and doing exactly every trade that I was supposed to do, that's what I'm most proud of there. Uh, the markets provided the return. I had nothing to do with that except to just keep doing what I do. So during that, that period, you were just waking up, just doing what you do. You, you're not even listening because that was a stressful time. I remember it myself. Um, but you know. it's stressful on your health, maybe, maybe on the economy. But when you're trading uh, a futures portfolio with, you know, corn and meat and currencies and everything else, precious metals, your job is to execute trades in those markets, not to think about what does COVID have to do with the price of gold? Price yeah. of gold is the price of gold. When gold breaks out and starts moving higher, you go long. Don't worry about whether it's COVID or whether it's the Federal Reserve doing something or the government is doing something. Just follow that price, get on the board, get on board the trend and, and ride it. 
Awesome. And and then crypto. So crypto came a little bit almost around the same time and it went crazy uh, in yeah. 2021. So how did you approach that? What I approach that is uh, interesting because a lot of people have asked me if I'm in cryptos. And my original answer was, no, nah, you know, all this flaky, the brokers are, you know, how am I going to really tell whether these brokers are sound or what they're doing? Some of them could be scams. We've already found a couple of like FTX and and uh, Silicon Valley Bank had some issues there. And these companies could go under and then you're, you know, even if you're right with your trading, you can't get your money out of them. You know, they're basically stealing your money. So I stayed away and, and just watched and watched. But I did notice that cryptos make some huge moves. And volatility is the lifeblood of uh, for a trader to make money. If a market stays dead even and goes nowhere, there's no potential to make or lose anything. Uh, so you need movement. That creates the risk possibilities. That creates the returns. So cryptos had that amount of volatility and risk, and that was intriguing, but I couldn't figure out what to do with it. And then finally, uh, the micro futures in Bitcoin and Ether came in by way of the CME. And now, hey, now you're in my field because I now I know an exchange is backing it. So you've got all the brokers involved in the futures exchange are backing the futures contract. And I can buy and sell it with equal ease. A lot of times in the crypto markets, you're only long. You can't really play the short side as well. Uh, so now I've got both directions covered. I've got it covered by an exchange. It's a futures ex contract, which is, I've been trading futures for probably 45 years. So it's no big deal to me. And that's uh, about three years ago or so, right around COVID is when I finally started trading um, the micro futures. Gotcha. So you're sticking to uh, the ones that are on the CME for the most part. Correct. Which is Bitcoin and Ether. That's pretty much it, right? I think. I don't think they have any others. If they do, oh, okay. I'm unaware of them. Yeah. Because like, for example, during that time period, I was, uh, I experimented opening an account in Binance and using all this sketchy way of trading it and i was like this is too much man i'm not gonna get involved i took my money out because like you you don't I, I wanted to short dogecoin so bad when um elon musk was on saturday night live but i, I missed that opportunity so you weren't yeah. involved with any of that stuff like with those kind of uh <laughs> okay no. how about um the meme stocks did you do anything with that were you involved at all like no. with uh, the uh, trend following I'll tell you what when i retired i for the longest while probably I've been retired about 20 years, probably a good half of that, maybe 10. I found myself wanting to do individual stocks and I set up strategies just like we talked about and the data came in and I ran them all and I had screening techniques to get the universe down to what I was going to be interested in. I had ranking methods to try to get my stocks down to the few that I put the orders in on. I had stop loss capability so that I'd track all these things. It just finally got to the point where I thought, man, I'm spending a lot of time doing all this trading. I'd rather be retired. I'm supposed to be retired. I want to go play golf. I want to go work out. I want to go on a hike. I want to enjoy this nice Arizona weather we usually have. So I started noticing, that, especially with computers, and you get this every morning on the, on the financial news. You watch Barney or something, and XYZ is down... 15% because they announced something earnings was was didn't meet expectations and boy it just gets ripped the computers just rip these things i thought you know how to it's for me to diversify my own portfolio across enough corporate num, uh, tickers so that i don't have too awfully much exposure to any one ticker is a lot of work why don't I just go use ETFs? So I went and screened 30 ETFs that are in sectors. So I'll have maybe two or three that are in the energies. And I've got one utility sector and I've got, you know, uh, the, the typical stuff, the, the chip manufacturers, the, oh gosh, uh, the consumer discretionary, consumer staples, the usual, you know, sectors that are trading out there. And I've got 30 of them. And I trend follow them. They have huge volume to them. They're easy to get in and out. 
and I get immediate diversification within each sector because each sector has maybe anywhere from 20 to 50 stocks in it. So right now I own 25 out of 30 sectors long. I probably, if you drill down underneath all those ETFs, have a portfolio of hundreds of stocks. And so I've really got a, a nice stable portfolio. I can sell that all the way out to zero if all the indicators uh, go south. So we get in a bad bear market, I'll be reporting to everybody that I've got zero out of 30 sectors long right now, and I'll have the hedges on. Uh, so I'll be trying, I'll be ending up making money on the down market. And uh, then when the market turns around and start, tries to take another run up, in come the buy signals and I just keep adding. Pretty so Right now I'm running 25 out of 30 long. Wow. So five and, of them are in cash. And uh, are you ever, how often are you ever like uh, completely flat in cash? How often? Have, yeah, uh, how often? We, like everything. It would, take a, it would take a COVID, during COVID was the last time actually. Uh -huh. uh, that was so severe that it kicked every indicator to uh, sell. And wow. uh, I went to full cash on the timing. Wow. But, okay. you know, it, it's going to take a, a bear market usually will kick me to zero. Uh, it could be a quickie, severe one like the COVID crash. It could be the bubble bursting in 2000. Uh, it could be the debacle in 2008 would have kicked me uh, completely cash. So there's times when that happens, but it's not every day. It, you know, we've gone, what, three, four years now uh, since the COVID crash and uh, I guess four. And uh, I haven't seen any, I, I haven't gone to completely zero exposure since the, over that time. And uh, what are your, what are your thoughts to start to wrap it up soon? Um, what are your thoughts overall? Cause I think today we, is it made a new all-time highs in the market, or was it yesterday? I'm I forgot. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Now we're breaking to new all-time highs from the from March 2020. It's been ripping through ever since, pretty much. So, what are, what are well, your thoughts on that? The, my thoughts are this: uh, I would be careful as a trader to be predicting anything about what happened today or what happened last week or anything. Uh, with respect to what the, does that mean that you need for the future, I would I would monitor what is the market doing. Well, for the last month or two, it's been going up. So, what? How have it, how, how have I been positioned based on the trends and the indicators going over to the long side? I've had as much as thirty markets or thirty sectors out of thirty sectors long. So the last couple of months have been lucrative for my portfolio. I would also add, though, as a good observer and as a trader, you should be in the back of your mind preparing for what could be a very quick and could be very devastating bear market along the way. When it happens, I don't have a clue. But I'll know the day that my indicators shift and I'll know when I have to sell out of my longs, I know when I have to put on my short uh, hedges. Uh, I'll hope that some of my futures transactions will pick up on that. Maybe bonds, uh, the stock market crashing, maybe the Fed's trying to drop interest rates to try to support the market. So I'll be going long bond futures. Maybe the figure that's inflationary, maybe gold goes long and I'm long gold, silver, platinum. You know, I'll just let it play out and but be prepared, have a plan before it happens. I get a lot of people asking me questions, you know, uh, COVID crash, we're down 30. What would you do now, Tom? Well, you know, what you should have done was way back when the market was making new highs, you should have been preparing and getting ready and having your strategy set and be ready to execute it so you protect yourself. But a lot of people, I fear, especially people your age that have seen generally pretty darn good markets with the exception of the COVID crash, there's been a lot of bull markets in the last decade. It's not gonna be that easy. And when something really devastating comes along, I mean, let me ask you this, what's the strategy for you as a trader 
if we go into a depression that lasts 10 years. That's, That's what happened back in 29. You know, you got to have a plan. <laughs> if you don't have a plan, the market is just going to kill you. You will yeah. not be able to stick around. So I think that that's what I see happening a lot with younger traders is they don't have, they aren't very prepared. Uh, and so what I would, I would observe about today's market is just accept the fact that it's making new highs and enjoy that ride, but be ready and, and to pull on a trigger if you, you have to really quickly to pivot to the downside, if that's what the market's going to throw our way. Sooner or later it will. And I'm prepared. Uh, I, I think most traders are not. We'll see. I think that's great that you pointed that out. You know, it reminded me when you're saying that about I saw the movie recently, Dumb Money. Um, mm. I don't know if you saw it. And like yeah. it reminded it took me back to that time period where everybody was making money and getting rewarded for bad habits. And in my mind at that time, I was thinking, OK, this is good for this time period, but like that's not going to work uh in a normal market environment it's like a very unique situation um yeah. and a lot of people you know the diamond hands crowd they just they treat it you know they buy a stock they hold it together and then like i don't know I, it's they were getting rewarded just for holding a stock and it just stocks just go higher you know it's just and that doesn't work you know so like what happens when that changes what's your plan you got to be able what? One of the reasons I called the new book uh, that I came out last year, The All-Weather Trader, <clears throat> which has also been a bestseller. It's it sold thousands of copies now. And I've gotten a lot of great reviews on it. But I think a lot of people are waking up to the fact that if you're trying to be an all-weather trader, you're basically trying to make money no matter what happens. That's kind of the way of describing it. No matter what the weather is, if it's snowing or tornado or you know, it's a calm, sunny day. How do you make money in no matter what kind of market it is? And that's kind of my lifetime quest. So when I wrote the book about it, it was sort of a autobiographical bi biographical, uh, synopsis of my evolution as a trader from I don't know what the heck I'm doing to hopefully 50 years later, picking up a few tricks along the way. And I tried to tell them all in the book. So it, I think that's why it's been popular. But I think a lot of people aren't really very all weather. They, I see comments on Twitter about, you know, to be a good trader, you have to know how to sit on your thumbs during a, an awkward down day. You know, if your setups aren't happening, then don't, don't try to force it, you know, and, well, setups, what, what does that mean? And are you saying that you can't make money to the downside? I mean, downside moves happen faster than upside moves. So, I mean, logically, if you want to make quick money, it's probably easier to do it to the downside if you can spot those opportunities. And they're out there. And if we get into a situation where it's a big bear market, there's going to be downside opportunities everywhere you look. And you could throw a dart and probably make money to this, the short side. So... I think people just have to figure out uh, traders should think about what they're going to do in those types of environments and just have a plan. You don't have to, you don't have to all of a sudden anticipate that, Oh, you know, the market's very overbought right now and it's a, a bubble going to burst and maybe I should start, you know, shorting the video or something like that. I think that's some idea. Just be prepared, have the plan and, and be prepared to execute it quickly and flawlessly. Awesome. And uh, OK, so your book is called All Weather Trader. What, your other book that you mentioned, what was the, the position sizing one? It's called uh, Successful Traders Size Their Position. Awesome. Uh, size Their Positions, Why and How. Awesome. Any other books that you have? Uh, I did one that I, I did for clients called Panic Proof Investing way back around 1995. I also uh, participated with Michael Covell. We wrote a we took all the interviews I've done with Michael and we kind of cleaned it up and added another chapter and um, and called Trend Following Mindset. And that ah, was a, okay. a very, uh, very good book. That's pretty much mostly uh, all about me uh, in a lot of the interviews I've done. 
And then, of course, speaking of interviews, my website, I, I haven't even totaled it up. I'm tempted to go in on one of my project quiet days here and just go through and count up all the minutes of interviews <laughs> that I've done over the last probably four years that are on that website. I, I have to be up into the 50, 60, 70 hours. Oh, really? I know I've oh. listened. I've listened to at least five of them. I know that. Oh, gosh, I, I have been interviewed so many times. It's amazing. That's that's and, awesome. Uh, and so and for free, you can listen to all these interviews. If you want to know everything about me or trading that, you know, things I've said over time, there's a lot of very, you know, free and useful ideas uh, in all those interviews. Uh, but I think that the all weather trader gets at the heart of the preparation that I think most traders need to start thinking about. So they're prepared when it does happen. You know, if something we get a bear market or, you know, maybe a two year down that goes down like 2000, uh, gosh, uh, tech stocks in 2000 were down 80%. Devastated people that weren't prepared for it. Devastated them. And, you know, the other side of that is it could be a, a huge opportunity if you're ready and you have some plan in place and can execute it. So yeah, that's my advice right now. I think when markets get like they do now, you just have to, if you're long, like I am pretty much, I, you know, have another good day, you know, nothing wrong with that. I, I hope it keeps going for the next year, the way it's going. I'll have another hundred percent year, but you know, if it turns uh, tomorrow, I'm prepared either way awesome so allweathertrader.com or allweathertrader the book and uh, how else can people find you i know you mentioned your website uh, and, website uh, website uh, which is a lot of free information for traders is enjoy the ride dot world not uh -huh. dot, dot world and then uh, probably the way that most people find me is the same way that you found me uh, on twitter uh, at basso b-a-s-s-o underscore Tom. Awesome. And, well, and, and, and be careful because at any one time, I probably have at least one or two imposters trying of course. to uh, <laughs> scam my followers, my 52,000 plus followers uh, out of crypto money or Forex deals or whatever. I don't sell you anything on DM. So if, if it's Tom Vasa with my picture trying to talk to you and do a crypto trade or something, just report and and block absolutely so i'll have all that in the show notes and once again tom thank you so much for coming on the podcast it's always uh awesome to have a market wizard on and sharing all the knowledge and insight over the years man it's, what what an awesome conversation thank hey, you thanks. once again that was fun thanks was david it was fun uh yeah, we can do it do it sometime again in the future we will we definitely will all right tom well have a great rest of your week and we'll talk soon